Good afternoon, everyone. Andy Jacob here with the Dotcom Magazine Entrepreneur Spotlight Series. I have a show for you today that you absolutely do not want to miss. I've been able to book Mr. Mike Shapiro. And Mike, you probably know about him. He's been a trader, a venture capitalist. He's a real estate expert. We'll get into that momentarily. He's a lecturer. He really is a, a multifaceted entrepreneur. He's got a new offering that he's the managing director of called Get Plunk, which is this super interesting and amazing application that he and his team have been able to develop. It's super cool. We're going to get into that momentarily. But Mike, thanks so much for slicing some time out to come on the Entrepreneur Spotlight Series today. Well, I appreciate the, uh, the offer. Thank you so much for interviewing me. Mike, this is great to have you on the show. There's so much to talk about. There's so much to uncover. There's so much to unravel with your entrepreneurial journey. We're going to get into that momentarily. But for those people maybe who have not heard of you before, maybe you could just share a little bit about your background before we get into it. Okay, well, first of all, the name of the company is Plunk, even though on the, uh, to get it on the website, it's called Get Plunk, but the actual name of the company is Plunk, so sorry to correct you, but um, I have uh, been a serial entrepreneur my entire uh, life. Um, I've been lucky enough to be able to do that, and I um, started out my career as a stock options trader on the exchange floor, so um, that's where I began this journey. <laughs> So I, I was a trader for about 10 years um, at the uh, Chicago exchanges, ending up at the Chicago Board of Options Exchange and became a specialist in, in, uh, in options. Uh, specifically, I was in the Merck pit, if everyone's heard of Merck Pharmaceuticals. So that's a long time ago. And it was a much a younger man's sport, let's put it that way, back in the day. So back in my day, we were actually on trading cards, if you can imagine. It was not electronic, and we were writing our trades on trading cards. And uh, we would actually literally call the New York Stock Exchange floor and the specialist to put in our stock orders. So it was, a, it was another time. <laughs> another that's era. That's awesome. That's awesome. So that's where it all started. Back in the day, you look much younger than what you're telling us your your background and experience is telling us about. And again, the name of the company is Plunk, but the application itself is Get Plunk. And we want to talk about that. So after your trading uh, expertise sort of uh, moved you into a different direction after you were done, there were some other things that you did that were very, very powerful, very strong. I know that uh, you went into the real estate field and dominated there. So before we talk about Plunk, tell us a little bit about your, your real estate uh, background and expertise. It's very fascinating. So I um, ended up uh, moving to Newport Beach. Uh, my wife and I were living in um, Arizona um, most of the time. And we, um, I think that sometimes events happen in your life and it changes your life. And so in our situation my wife was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2002 and uh, uh we had a second home here in newport beach and i think it changes what you uh think about what you're doing and not doing and so we moved here uh, fortunately our next door neighbor was uh, her oncologist that ended up saving her life so i don't know if you believe in those things uh, you know meant to be but um so we um moved to Newport, not that it's a nice place to live, don't get me wrong, but I think it was a feeling of her being safe. And, you know, we lived next to her doctor. And so we moved in. I think we sort of realigned our life at that moment in time. I think that when you face mortality issues very early um, in your life, uh, especially with your, my best friend, my, you know, uh, my soulmate, um, I think that you realign what you're, what you're thinking. And so, um, we kind of retired early, which was a mistake, um, obviously, in the way I am. And so we said, you know, enough is enough. Let's really enjoy our lives. So within a year and a half or so, I went absolutely out of my mind. And I started a venture capital firm, was looking for investments uh, so that I um, could get active again because I just wasn't feeling very good about doing nothing. Uh, and so I formed a venture capital firm and I was approached by various deals. And one of the deals, and mind you, this was in 07. And one of the deals was um, a real estate company in Newport Beach. 
that was um, facing issues. Um, it was, you know, obviously the writing was in the wall in 07. There were some issues associated with, um, was approached by a friend of mine in um, Arizona to ask me to invest in his company because he, uh, in Arizona and Las Vegas, I think was ground central for the disaster that occurred with um, with the real estate business back in those days. And so he asked me for an investment. I looked into uh, opening an office in Newport because he wanted the seasonality in Arizona. And also um, he said the writing was in the wall. He felt more comfortable in, in this area, in this trade area. I subsequently called my real estate agent here and said, what do you think? And she said, well, the company that she was working with called Home Real Estate Group was having issues. And, you know, maybe I could figure out a way to either merge the two of them or do something. So anyway, long story longer, I ended up making an investment. And uh, it was one of those investments where I really wasn't particularly productive. So I was showing up in my investment on a daily basis. I'm not necessarily sure they were very happy about that up front. But then I learned the business and I had a lot of runway. I think timing is a lot to do with success. And I had a lot of runway because obviously I closed on this in March of 08. We know the bottom of the market was September of 08 when Lehman failed. That's my opinion, of course, when I think the bottom of the market was. So um, I learned the business, uh, you know, the real estate business. And I noticed that uh, in real estate, in this specific trade area, um, people were looking at the real estate ads as, uh, almost appraising the value of their own uh, their own net worth. They were looking at real estate ads almost like they were looking at the stock pages. Um, and so subsequently, it was a, a situation where I said, hey, this is interesting. We should really try to mimic more of a Goldman Sachs or Merrill Lynch than we should try to mimic other brokerages. And that's kind of how I try to direct Home Real Estate Group. And we grew from... Uh, uh, essentially almost a bankrupt company at 200 million to uh, almost 3 billion in sales. We were actually the third or fourth largest Sotheby's in uh, the world. And I ended up uh, merging the company and selling for lack of a better description, the company to Pacific Sotheby's uh, in San Diego. And now it is, is the uh, second largest um, Sotheby's in the world. And it has almost 8 billion in sales. So I'm very proud of that. And um, I'm still associated with the company. I've been completely disengaged from it, um, for lack of a better description. And uh, my wife is a real estate agent there as well, and she's quite successful. So that's where it, I ended up in a situation where I was once again without a position, and I went back into my venture capital um, hat, and I was looking for something to um, do again. And uh, I uh, met these two gentlemen from Seattle, uh, Brian Lent and uh, David uh, Bloom. And uh, they told me a story of what they wanted to do. I thought it was amazing. I wanted to invest and I really wanted to work with them. And that's where we came to where I'm doing right now, which is Plunk. So it's just I very love exciting. It. I love it. Plunk. And then the app is Get Plunk. So this is a remarkable story, Mike. And, and, Thank, thank goodness that your wife is, is, is doing better. The story about you moving and your neighbor saved her life who was a physician. Things like that happen when you stay positive and, and you keep your, your, your wits about you. And the fact that, you know, your wife is your soulmate and is, you know, a beautiful, you have a beautiful relationship is amazing. And for entrepreneurs, if you have a partner that supports what you do, that is always very, very helpful. And I know that Mike, and his wife support each other in a remarkable way. And that's a beautiful, beautiful story. Uh, your venture capital firm led you into the real estate business. You became just uber successful. The Sotheby's that you put together did over $3 billion in sales. You sold it. Now they're doing $7 billion in sales. It's absolutely unbelievable. And then you meet a couple guys up in Seattle. And here we are in 2021, and you've got Plunk. So let's talk about Plunk because it's really not only a great name, but this is an app. And I was so fascinated when I read about it, designed to predict, besides other things, what renovation projects will improve your home's value. It's like an amazing idea. I mean, this is an earth shattering idea that you and these guys have. Let's talk about it. How did all this come about? Uh, you know, I think that uh, there was a combination of uh, many events. Um, the two gentlemen, as I spoke of before, um, are the ones who created the company. Uh, they were looking for somebody 
that um, understood real estate business as an insider. And also I had a, an unusual background where I was a stock options trader. And so I understood the equity markets and the relationships associated with it. So they always called me a unicorn. So when they presented me these ideas, I had um, really embraced it before. I mean, I'm not saying it's not their idea, but I really had embraced this concept uh, many, many years ago and had written about it and all of the various um, aspects associated with housing being one of the most important asset classes in, in, in our world. And so, in fact, um, housing today is a $40 trillion asset class. It dwarfs almost all of the other asset classes. I think when we um, started this, you know, and I don't want to um, make light of COVID. It's been an awful year for a lot of people, and I'm not trying to um, not understand how awful it has been. Many people have died, and there's been ma massive disruption options and many people are unemployed. So I'm not trying to gloss over uh, that situation. However, I believe that COVID created a situation where um, it became a primary focus of people's attention, housing. And I think that uh, real estate in, in residential real estate, in fact, has become somewhat commercial. Commercialized. I think that's an accelerant. I think what our hope was as we developed this product that people would look at it this way. And I think that, that this year has sort of brought people much ra more rapidly into the fold of looking at their primary residence as a major investment and what do they do and how do they handle it and what do they do to invest in it for um, future growth. So we are the first uh, real-time valuation uh app application. And so we're using through neural networks, machine learning, and um, writing uh, artificial intelligence software um, exactly on a granular basis. What is your real-time valuation? Literally at that moment in time, people don't understand that their houses actually reprice daily. In fact, they reprice, in my opinion, um, probably minute by minute, the same reaction that the stock market has to news or as they call reading the tape, I say, you know, when you're reading what's going on or whatever news is going on, the same thing has happened to housing. I think housing in general is not adjusted to that um, in the same way, even though the buyers are instantly identifying what they think something's worth based on what's happening around them in their environment. But sellers tend not to do that. And it's usually a valuation is really based on, in my opinion, outliers. So, you know, what's the high con? And what's low comp. So what we're trying to do is create, and we're doing it now, real-time valuation. Secondarily, we're giving you a thing called Plunk Value, which is unusual. And that's um, essentially what would your house be worth um, if you did the following things, or if you were to change the bathroom, if you were to change the kitchen, if you were to put a pool in. So, and so we're making also project recommendations associated with this application. So we're trying to manage this in incredibly important asset um, to uh, our country, our world. Um, I think it's really in the world, but we're obviously specifically focusing on the United States. So I want to make it clear that we're only releasing it in Seattle right now. We um, will obviously be rolling out on a national basis, but we're testing out uh, in the Seattle market at this point, because for obvious reasons, um, making sure that we work all the bugs out. So I could also say um, that uh, you'll have to edit this comment out right now, but you're not releasing this before April 26. Is that correct? We won't. Okay, perfect. So now I can also say that we um, are also part of the REACH program. So NAR um, is an investor National Association of Realtors, which is the largest trade organization in the United States. This is a really important thing to talk about. We're one of 16, and I have to uh, verify exactly how many companies are in this program where they are thinking that we are the future of potential um, technology-driven um, applications to the future of real estate. So it's, it's really an honor to be part of that and to work with other companies that have selected companies like DocuSign were part of this REACH program. So it's kind of exciting to see other people seeing what we're trying to do. This is probably premature, but on, on top of what, what uh, we're doing at Plunk is that the drivers behind the Plunk application and also the data science is also giving me an opportunity to make prescient capability as far as what will be the future of real estate. Because real estate, like all other asset classes, is correlative to the entire world of asset classes. And I don't want to complicate matters, but 
if you really think about it, even in the stock market, for example, if one drug company goes up, then many others may follow. Or if oil goes up, then maybe the oil companies will go up. So there's always this correlative behavior between um, asset classes. And so I think that real estate in general has never been looked at that way before. And that's what I'm also looking at uh, in my part of the business and looking how do we take care of and, and understand where these values are going. So being prescient in terms of what those behaviors are on a national basis. Michael, that's incredible. You know, you can see where your background and experience has come in in a major way with with the Plunk interface. It's very, very interesting. As you mentioned, uh, housing is a $40 trillion uh, asset class. You look at it in a much different way than other people. And that's why you are where you are. And that's why you're able to think sort of as a zykus about what's going to happen in the future. And not only the housing asset class, but others as well. So when we talk about this application and we talk about uh, the Plunk interface, what what caught our attention and we think is really a game changer is your app will tell me that if I do certain things, if I add a pool or I do this or I do that, that this will happen to my asset. This will happen to my home value. And you're using some type of uh, AI underlayment to, to figure that out as well as other data. So it's really an incredible application. So, so you, you're releasing now, uh, in one part of the country to make sure that it works and that you've got the bugs kicked out of it so that you can take it nationwide. For the younger entrepreneurs watching the show, maybe you could talk about sort of the reason why you're doing that and why it's important to make sure that things really work before you go big time. Well, having um, been in business for a long time uh, and having uh, done multiple uh, companies and startups in my career, I think that um, you know releasing something nationally uh, and having significant bugs is does not necessarily uh, bode well for the future of a company. So we really want to make sure that um, that what we're doing is pretty accurate here. And so I think Seattle was obviously is the home of where Plunk is headquartered. It's also the home of many many tech companies. In fact, some of the most important tech companies in the world. And so it's a very good place to um, test this out because there's a lot of people who are working in artificial intelligence and will really um, put our hand to the fire for lack of a better description. Also, the Seattle market has multiple types of housing, which was critical uh, for us to understand um, being rural, a city, an inner city, um, you know, secondary markets that were really growing due to tax implications. So there was a lot of um, variables of the Seattle market that was really attractive to doing a test and really uh, resonates through the nation. I mean, I'm not 100% as far as, you know, each area is granular, clearly, but um, it is a pretty good place to start. So I love it. I love it so much, Michael. This is really great. And something that caught, you know, my eye and our, our, our team's eye was, let's say I'm a homeowner. And let's say I've got $20,000 to spend in my budget. We can pick a number. It could be 10,000. It could be 100,000. But let's just use $20,000. By using your app, it would appear to us that we're able to sort of figure out what the best bang for the buck is to improve my home. Is that sort of one of the ideas behind Plunk? Yes, absolutely. It's about being smart about your investment. It's about how having tools to determine um, what is the best way for me to do it. It's not always going to be positive. There may be negative implications to doing something in a trade area. So that's where the um, AI comes into play. So in certain places, like I'm in Newport Beach, a pool will add value. Value. Well, obviously, if you live in Chicago, no one necessarily wants a pool. So, um, you know, I think that there's different things that are driven by different applications or different investments. So the idea is that your home is a primary investment for your future, for what you believe your net worth is, for many, many things. It is potentially the cornerstone of your entire um, financial portfolio. And so there are very few tools, if any, are giving you uh behavioral patterns of what should you do and how do you protect that and how do you grow that? So grow your major asset. 
So I think that's where we're in a space that nobody really is looking at um, in the same level of granular behavior associated with different, uh, different uh, parts of the country. Mike, that's amazing. And, you know, we only have been able to get you for a certain amount of time today. I know that, you know, I wanted to book you for a lot longer, but I know you're very busy with your, with your new plunk business and all the other ventures that you're involved with. But I wanted to take our conversation since I have you on the show and move it toward entrepreneurship. I, I know that you've, you've done some lecturing. I know that you're, you've mentored a lot of people and it's wonderful what you've been able to accomplish in the type of information and background and experience that you've been able to impart on, on others. So while I have you on the show, I wanted to sort of have you talk to the entrepreneurs watching the show, because many entrepreneurs reach out to me and they say, Andy, you know, what's the best way to deal with challenges? What's the best way to deal with problems? I'm hitting a pothole in the road. What's the best way for me to sort of mentally get my arms around what it takes to be an entrepreneur? And I know you've lectured on this. I know you're an expert on this. So maybe you could talk to the younger entrepreneurs watching the show and let them know what it takes to, to be a great entrepreneur, to get around those potholes, to, to approach the challenges in a powerful way, and, and to have that type of attitude necessary to wake up in the morning and get at it. Well, this is an interesting um, thought. And in fact, I am um, part of the Forbes organization, and I'm actually writing a book on this very uh, thought process. And I'm also launching a podcast of my own through Forbes Radio. Uh, regarding, uh, you know, what makes entrepreneurs tick, and I call it read the tape. So I, um, I believe really that um, everyone, and I don't mean to sound corny, but everyone has some inner genius. Everyone has something about them that is special, like a fingerprint. And I really think that um, it's about self-discovery of what is it that you do really, really well? What is that it's what you're made of. And then pursuing that in an entrepreneurial spirit, being on your own is really um, the best advice I can give. Uh, you know, I was fortunate in the situation, and I mean to bring family into this, but I was fortunate to be raised by a father who was in a really bad situation as a child and it was all conditional love and, and it was very, uh, a lot of poverty and it was not a great situation. So my father, um, raised me in a peculiar way where he celebrated my losses. And so I have a leg up in some ways that I um, don't fear uh, losing or I don't fear failure. And some people fear failure, some people fear success. So I have been in a unique situation, which I'm trying to share is laughing at your failures. So something you learn as a trader that I think is really applied across um, all businesses is that and I think even you said it earlier, um, uh, you know, when we were offline, that uh, you can only be right 51% of the time. That 1% is a very good living. And you're going to be wrong 49% of the time. And I think that when you learn how to be wrong or how to fail, you become successful. And it's about the pivot. You just don't just stand there if your business is not working or if things are not working for you. You move. You change things. You adjust. So I think it's learning that and that self-discovery and feeling confident about moving forward is, is, uh, is really part of the entrepreneurial spirit. Also, I think that people fail to understand like that communications, everyone is selling something. I mean, whether you, if you're engaged in business, you're selling something. And if you understand what's your best communication skill that is sometimes the best way to do it. I and mean, in my situation, I'm very verbal. And so I understand that maybe we're not at the end of anybody watching this thing, maybe I'm not verbal enough. But anyway, I think that um, if you were to um, look at that, that's important to develop that. So if you're good in written communications, utilize that. If you're good in in communications, being verbal, or whatever it is that you do well, sometimes it's physical communication that are important so uh and and also read uh i can't stress this enough read the room read the tape read what's around you read um the environment uh you have to adjust you can't just rush in you have to adjust to um what is it that you're trying to accomplish and, and one of the things also i'd like to talk about i'm sorry to give you this uh, uh, constant stream of consciousness excuse me but um 
the narrative is very, very important about what you're doing. And you need to explain what you're doing rapidly, succinctly, and clearly so that your entire audience understands exactly what you're doing. And I think that's important. Some of the greatest entrepreneurs of our time, uh, which is ironic, were made fun of when they started out, okay? But ultimately, they became the ones that we, we admire the most, you know? And so one of the great examples of uh, somebody who understands and pushes forward about their narrative is Elon Musk. And I think he's a genius that gets himself into trouble quite a bit because he consistently um, creates this narrative. But look at what he's been able to accomplish by explaining what he's doing, delivering the goods, and explaining the narrative and what, what is he trying to accomplish. And of course, uh, what his valuations are and the companies that he's worked at. I love it. I love it, Mike. Now, you mentioned laugh at your failure. So for the younger entrepreneurs watching the show, Mike, is is that something that that was innate to you? Is that something that you learned from your father as a young man? Or was that something that you developed later in life? And, and asking the question a different way, for those people that are having a tough time laughing at their failures, what can you tell them to help them get through this sort of pain point where they're at right now? Well, I think that humor is an important part of being successful. I don't mean that you need to do stand up, but I mean that you should be able to laugh at um, what's happening around you. Uh, life in general is sometimes quite absurd. And if you were able to look at what's going on and laugh at all of these things and enjoy yourself, I mean, they've even shown in health that one that laughs more is healthier. So it's important to embrace that. And, and it's important to embrace at, you know, humor associated with it. So when I was running um, home real estate group at Turner Pacific, I would, a great deal of my time was when people would fail with something is making light of it. And it's like, well, what are you going to do next? And how do you do this? So laughing at failure, yes, my father taught me that. But that's what I try to share with others. So you do need to laugh. Your, I mean, I'm not trying to be silly. There are things that you can't just laugh at. There are health care issues and things like that. Of course, you don't laugh at that. But in general, in your existence, you know, when things go wrong and things always do, then rather than sit there and saying, oh, I wish I did. I wish I didn't. I, and getting wrapped up in that is, is, is a mistake. And also, I think that people tend to gravitate to negatives before they gravitate to positives. So you can have, I think this is a shared human quality. You can have 99 positive reviews, like you're doing this great job, you're doing great. And all of a sudden, one person says something negative, and then suddenly you've defined yourself with that negative comment. So it's hard. You have to adjust. I'm not telling you anything and your audience, anything they've ever heard before. What I'm trying to say is that you need to practice this. This isn't just about saying this. Practice it. So that's another important thing about um, how do you do this? Practice it. Just to say I can't. Like, that's not an answer. I love it. And Mike, you, you're known for putting, <clears throat> pardon me, great teams together. You know, as a venture capitalist, when you look at a company and you look at a solopreneur or an entrepreneur, how important is the team? In other words, when you're looking at maybe making an investment, kind of putting your venture capitalist hat on just for a minute, Mike, when you look at that entrepreneur and you look at what they've been able to accomplish at the company, how important is the team versus just the entrepreneur leading the way? I think the team is, is no one can do anything alone. I don't think anyone would claim that. Uh, and I believe that the team is probably the most important thing. Um, and what is the team built around and how are they communicating and how are they working together? So I'm lucky in having had multiply great teams in my existence. And uh, in, in fact, at Plunk, it's an extraordinary team of professionals. Uh, that is probably the most important thing is um, the team, to be honest with you. It's more important than being the entrepreneur or the leader. Is like, how, how is that being supported, those ideas, those concepts? Or is the team able to uh, stop certain things or able to communicate effectively? So it's important. I don't think there's any one way. I don't want to come off and saying, you know, you know, this is the way to do it. I mean, my specific career 
your choices have been very relationship oriented team building. That's important to me, but that doesn't always mean that's the most successful way an organization can work. I mean, for example, the military is quite the opposite. A team is the most important thing. Obviously, they're protecting each other's lives, but there's a direct command uh, aspect to it. So they're both successful ways. I'm taking extreme versions, one or the other, but it is, I can't stress it enough how important that team is and what their background is. And I can't stress enough uh, having people that have experience, not only necessarily education. I think education is a very important thing. I'm not saying light of that, but having people that have experience in a specific field um, is very important to building a team. The other thing is, I always say this, and it's not like I'm inventing this line, but you know, you are paid for your creativity. And so if you don't, um, are not creative in whatever position you're in, that is uh, sort of a dead end. I mean, this is about being an entrepreneur. And so never do that. Ex express yourself. You need to be creative in whatever you're doing. And that's really important. And that goes back to what I was saying before. The most celebrated entrepreneurs were early on were like, what are you doing? You don't know what you're doing. This is a wrong idea. And now they're, you know, look what they did. Look how they've created what they've created. Look at what they've done. And you can name all these companies. I love it, Mike. And I only have a couple more questions. I know sure. I'm keeping you over, but it's great no, no, to have no. you on the show. I don't know when Hopefully I'm going to get you back. You. <laughs> uh, no, this is fantastic. So, Mike, so for some people in the world, they have a tough time getting out of bed. I mean, they, they watch Shark Tank and they watch shows like this and they have an idea or they – have something in their mind that's percolating, but they just can't take that first step. And, and you know, maybe they're just so worried about failure or maybe they're, they've been told no their whole life or maybe they've been told they can't do it their whole life. So for those people that are sitting on the sidelines, this sort of talks about, you know, in relationship to your uh, hopefully new book that's going to be coming out soon called Read the Tape or your podcast, what do you say to those people that just can't take that first step? They just can't, they're, they're paralyzed. They just can't get that first step done. Well, you know, first of all, I'm not, um, I want to make it clear that I'm not professionally trained as far as um, a therapist. So, I mean, the first thing that I would say is, I mean, there are very real things associated with depression and there are some clinical issues. So the first step is um, if I'm with somebody and they're asking me for coaching, I uh, try to identify as early on as possible if there's anything that's clinical because I'm not qualified. And so I hopefully they seek out somebody to get them in a position where they're feeling good enough to want to embark. So the first step is just that. It's like, it's hard to explain. It's the first step is always the hardest step, but you just make it. The old line, come on in, the water's fine. You just do it. Every day you do it. So sometimes if I'm coaching somebody, it's accountability. What did you do today? Sometimes it's, I said earlier in this podcast, it's account, uh, you know, uh, self-discovery. So I ask questions like, you know, name five things that uh, you know, you do well that are easy. Just give me five things that are just been easy in your life. Can you tell me something that's been easy in your life? Can you tell me something that is just gives you joy? And sometimes that self-discovery leads you to the place of word. How do you make that first step? What are you comfortable in? Um, I don't like uh, a lot of people where they say, just do it. I mean, yeah, that's great. But everyone has a just do it in a different way. And everyone has different um, capability. So that's really, that's where that self-discovery comes from. So I can't just say to you, you know, come into the water. If you're fearful of water, there are steps that one needs to take in order to do that. Maybe just go into the kiddie pool first or put your foot in the water, things like that in order to accomplish those goals. I don't know if that's helpful. And I'm sure you've heard this over and over again. So I have, like I've said before, a unique situation where my father made me uh, a, a sociopathic risk taker. And I don't mean that in a negative way, but he's given me, and I try to share that with others, the ability to laugh at these failures. So I'm like, I'll keep taking risks. And, and ultimately that is the decision process. And if you don't take those risks, whatever that is, you won't get the performance. You won't get where you want to go. So it is about calculated risk taking, no matter what. Absolutely. Let's talk about that, Mike. So what did your dad say? Did he say something like when you made an error or mistake? Did he did he say, oh, son, you know, 
that's great that that happened because the more of those mistakes that you make, the faster you're going to get to the good stuff. Like, how did he position that for you? Because there's even fathers watching the show that are wondering how they can get this can do attitude out of their kids. Well, I think that um, he grew up in such a way that everything was conditional So that I think what he was trying to give me, and I think it's the ultimate thing, and I'm not certainly an expert in families, but the ultimate thing is unconditional love to your child or anybody who's around you and accepting um, all of these issues. And it creates the um, springboard uh, to do that. So what did he do? He literally celebrated my failures, whether I made a goal for the other soccer team as a child, he would be the first person I would remember him being on the sidelines screaming out, that's my kid. I mean, no parents were doing that. He'd be doing that. Or if I was a swimmer, I remember starting on the other side of the pool and backstroke. And like, imagine a child, I don't remember how old I was, <laughs> so like last year, you know, the uh, swimmers take your mark and then open backstroke you pull up and I'm, no one else is around me they're all on the other side of the pool I was a kid and I remember my father laughing hysterically and saying that was my kid and I had to go around the other side and just praising all of these um, train wrecks uh, in my existence I mean I remember this is a funny story if you want me to share this or not my first job um, is it as a kid I think I was 16 years old and I worked and I, I certainly love Burger King even to this day my first job as a Burger King, I was on the Whopper line. And I, um, I remember, you know, two pickles, whatever it was doing all this stuff. And I remember in order for um, you to uh, get a burger as part of your pay, okay, you had to work four hours. And I thought that was incredibly unfair. I mean, I'm 16 years old, mind you, and in Westport, Connecticut. And I said, well, don't you think it's fair that I can get a burger or whatever? It was after school, like two hours of work. So I literally uh, did a walkout strike at 16 years old, the Burger King, and shut down the Burger King in my town to, and I convinced the other workers, well, I mean, probably the manager was like 19 or 20 at the time, um, to shut it down in order for us to get our burger. So I was a labor leader at 16, and I remember going home and the manager calling my uh, father, I think, and my father is like, what do you do now? And just laughing hysterically and like coming to me, he says, you're a labor leader, you know, and just like embraced me of even that um, expression of, you know, this isn't the right thing to do. So, yes, I try to share that with others in embracing, you know, what's the right thing to do. I can't stress that enough. In fact, he used to say, and I'm sorry to make this a show about my dad. It was important to me, but he used to say to me um, things that resonate with me today very much so. And I think they should resonate with everybody. There is no gray. OK, there's a the right decision and the wrong decision. Make the right decision. I'll never forget that. So. Uh, you know, that was my upbringing. He died very young in my life. He died uh, at 55 years old, believe it or not. Excuse me, I was 25 and I think much uh, formative still years to have him. And, you know, and I've had to learn on my own from that point on because I had that sort of safety net that he had given me. Like I could no matter what, if I were to fail, there was somebody there pushing me. Or, and so I, I've had to do a lot of this on my own, but I had that beginning. And so I try to do that for others. You know, if people talk about their failures, like springboard from it, like look at it, laugh at it, enjoy it uh, and figure it out from there. Yeah. There are no give it, there are no give me's. Okay. But uh, that's, that's kind of my thought process. I love it, Mike. So, you know, there's a, there's the old story about you plant a tree and you plant it in the ground and you plant it straight up and down. You water it so that that tree becomes a wonderful tree that's not crooked, that's not going to fall over, that goes straight and it keeps on flowering up. And that sounds to me like the type of uh, relationship you have with your dad. And he planted a straight tree and and he's done. And what you're talking about is truly remarkable. And it's really something that entrepreneurs can learn from. You know, there's no gray. There's there's right. There's there's the right way. There's the wrong way. There's the the way you want to do it. Though There's the way you don't want to do it. And there's no gray in the middle. So always do it the right way. Be great. Just be great. Do everything great. Absolutely. And it was like, you know, the critical piece of the puzzle when we launched Plunk, I think it was July 19. It wasn't too far before uh, COVID started. So as a, as a new business, it's difficult to manage something like that that were to happen to you when you have, you know, 10 
people working for you. And so the fact that the team came together, the fact that the, the entire uh, leadership of the organization and the people that were working there all came together is, is remarkable um, teamwork and to get to this point through COVID and to create this product. So I'm really proud of that. I'm really proud of the people that I work with and work uh, at the company and what they've been able to accomplish through this very, very difficult time in, in remote work and, and also uh, getting to this point. So it is imperative that making those decisions, like the right decision, and that is in a large part, not only me who was doing that, but the people that were um, um, I'm partners with at this point, we're making the rights. What's the right thing to do? And look where we are today versus what may be, you know, what was the the quicker way to do it or what was the less expensive way to do it or whatever it was, it was like, what's the right decision? What's the right decision for our uh, employees? What's the right decision of whether the product should be done? What's the right decision? Always driven by that um, basic uh, statement is very important. I can't stress that enough. So I sorry. love it. That's a defining a message. <laughs> I love it. I love it so much, Mike. That's a defining message in your life and it's worked and served you very well. I have one last question. I know I've kept you over, but here's <laughs> my final question to you. Uh, you know, we've been so fortunate to be able to speak to so many higher profile CEOs and founders at the dot-com magazine entrepreneur spotlight series. And I decided not too long ago to finish the interviews with the same question for all of our entrepreneurs, because it's very interesting to hear the answer. And, and the question is, what is your why? What gets you up in the morning? What gets you going? What is Mike Shapiro's why? Ridiculous, but I love um, working with people. I love creating things. I love seeing people succeed. I get a lot of... Um, great feelings of seeing what happens when people reach their goals, not only mine, but others. So that's the why. I mean, when I was in a fortunate position where I had essentially retired because of a medical issue that my wife had and was in a fortunate position to be able to do that early in my life, I recognized at that point um, in my early 40s that that wasn't what was defining me and why. In fact, it was the worst thing I could possibly have done was do nothing um, and just please myself with, you know, every day is a Sunday. Many people like, you know, I'm not saying that's not a good thing. Many people like doing that, I guess. But for me, it was about creating things and working with others and seeing those people reach their goals. There's nothing I get more pleasure out of than when I, and this has happened to me many times times when people say to me, Mike, you changed my life. And I love that. Hopefully the better. Um, but yes, I, I gives me a great feelings. And so um, perhaps that's the why is because, you know, uh, because my wife was sick, we couldn't have children. And, um, and so, you know, maybe that's my, the reason I get up, you know, because I like helping others. In fact, I love helping young people get to their goals. It's really such a pleasure for me. And I was privilege to do that in the real estate uh, business because there's so many young people entering and I always would work with them and coach them. And even today, um, seeing young people and where are they going and what do they want to do and how do they want to um, reach their goals in their life? Yes, that is the why. It's And, and I, I love it. I just absolutely love seeing that success and whatever that is. And I don't want to, I know that was always so money oriented in regard to um, a lot of these uh, podcasts or, you know, uh, technically money is the scorekeeping, so to speak, but that's not always what drives people. So I'm as much in, enjoy someone who has artistic success, or there are many different other types of, of success that have nothing to do with money. So I don't want to make light of that. And if that's what your pursuit is, and that's what you want to do, and you want to be an entrepreneur in that, that's great. We need more of that, frankly. And it's not just the art of making money. So anyway, if I could leave you with that, <laughs> I love it. I love it, Mike. It's, it's 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 creative. It's your it's your creative and artist side coming out through a business uh, avenue that provides you the opportunity to help others. And there's no better why in the world than to help other people. And and congratulations on that, Mike. That's really really beautiful. 
Well, we've, we've spent more time than you've allotted me, so I've stolen some <laughs> of your time, Mike, but thank you so much. This has been really a pleasure to have you on the show. I've been waiting for this interview for a, almost two months, and I just want to thank you so much for telling us all about Plunk and what's going on with the Get Plunk app. It's going to be amazing as you do the nationwide rollout after you work it out completely in the one area that you're currently in, which is the, uh, the Seattle area, I believe. Is that correct? Yes, right now is Seattle only, and then we will be doing a national rollout as, as a time goes on. Yes, so we're working out all the bugs. So this is super cool. I can't wait to get on the app because I need to know where the best place to make home improvements is for, for my asset as part of this uh, large $40 trillion asset class that I learned from you today. Mike, you've been a true delight, and thank you so much for coming on the show today. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time as well. So. 